Okay, in this last chapter, we'll take a look at the final materials, discuss how they were created, and demonstrate how they'll be used in the final structure. Here is our roof texture from the previous chapter. It's an okay starting point, but it all looks a little bland, so I wanted to add some weathering and rust. To add the rust, I pasted in a basic rust tiling texture. Then I created an empty layer directly below it. If you hold the Alt key and click between two layers, it will create a clipping mask. This means the top layer will only show up through the pixels of the bottom layer. This is great because you can use custom shapes, brushes, or any Photoshop tool to manipulate the mask without ever changing the pixels on the rust layer. This would be considered a non-destructive workflow. In this example, I had already created a custom shape from a rust reference image. The nice thing about using custom shapes is the selection will be very clean since shapes start out as a vector path rather than rasterized pixels. Remember, you can get a layer selection by holding control and clicking its thumbnail. Now, since we have a nice clean selection, we can use this to adjust our gloss texture. I can just fill this in with a darker value. I also decided to take an oxidized copper texture and blend it over our diffuse using the color dodge layer mode. At this point, the rust is visible in the diffuse and gloss map, but I haven't updated the normal map yet. We can use a rust mask to create a simple two-tone height map. Just make the rust area a lighter value and the background a flat black. Now you can copy the layer to clipboard, paste it into Crazy Bump, and tweak the settings until the rust looks appropriate. Now we can paste it back into our working file, get our mask selection again, and then invert selection, and delete you can press Control shift i to invert. We can also set this layer to overlay so that it still blends with the underlying normal map. All right, so that's how the roof material was made. Now let's look at how it was actually used on the structure. I originally started out with a flat 4x4 plane, and then I used a FFD 3x3x3 modifier to shape it. Next, I applied a mesh smooth to round it out more, and I added an unwrap UVW. Since this roof piece is basic, I can get away with selecting all the faces and doing a quick planar map followed by a relax to get a nice straight UV shell. Then I can just scale them up to the appropriate tiled size. From here, I went in with a cut tool, framed off the geometry that I wanted to delete. But remember to right click when cutting to stop your current cut, and you can start it from a new position with left click. Next, I removed the end faces and added a shell modifier to give the whole roof a thickness. I also cut out an individual tile, shelled it, unwrapped it, and set its pivot point to the top. This allowed me to place a few more crooked pieces on the edges to make the silhouette more believable. You might also turn on face snap so you can slide this along the actual roof shape. Okay, the next material we're going to look at is the tiling tech panels. This material was created using the same tiling ZBrush technique as the roof. So to recap, we model out some high poly pieces, map them with a placeholder diffuse that will show up in ZBrush, export them out as an OBJ, import each piece as its subtool in ZBrush, and then we use the tiling ZBrush trick to fill in the entire canvas. After the placement was complete, I exported the tiling diffuse in normal. I originally applied the tech panel materials to a cube and started cutting them out and shelling them. I thought this layered effect looked promising, so I went back to the main body of the building and applied the approach throughout. Okay, so far we've looked at two tiling materials, which are great for covering large surfaces, but they don't really give us an opportunity for nice, custom, unique details. In the concept, I based the windows and surrounding details on a few of these reference images, and I really wanted them to be a focal point on the final model. So, I first created some nice high-poly meshes for the window and framing brackets using the Sub-D workflow discussed in the grenade tutorials. I then rebuilt the low poly pieces so they fit really closely with the original and I baked out a diffuse, normal, and lighting map. My first pass on the material ended up being a little too saturated, so I did another pass using Dedu and was much happier with the results. I also made sure to bake the details separately so that I can mix and match them and create other details. For instance, by separating the window from its framing bracket, I can have variants without the window or use just the window without the frame. Another detail that has come in very handy on this material has been the metal beam on the side. It tiles vertically, so I've used it to frame the tech paneling with actual geometry. For these trim parts, I would just select the outside edges that I wanted to frame, hit Create Shape from Selection, 
and then make it renderable and make sure generate mapping coordinates is on. This allows you to unwrap all the UVs for the trim pieces very quickly. Okay, now let's take a look at the concrete. I originally started this texture thinking it would be placeholder, but I ended up liking the results. All I did was start with the photo reference here, then I ran it through Crazy Bump for some of the surface noise, and I made a quick and dirty height map. I ran this through Crazy Bump as well, and mixed the two normal maps so that the nice crunchy surface noise mixed with the crisper concrete grooves. Then on the actual model, I also extruded back the larger grooves in the material and cut some additional cracking and layering. This process I've commonly referred to as modeling from the texture. We've done the same thing on the tech panels as well as the roof details, and it basically gives us a way to make some unique changes to a modular material. Now, because CryEngine uses real-time lighting, one of the trade-offs is that you can only have one UV channel. In the past, you would do things like add grime, graffiti, water stains to your material using another UV channel unwrapped with a different layout. The good news, however, is we can still do this with the use of decals. Here's an example of the decal texture I'm using, and the important thing is that you can save out a high-quality alpha with it. A decal material is created just like any other material, but you have to turn on decal here under shader generation params. You can also further reduce the decal's opacity here, but I recommend that you just change that in the alpha so that you can maintain a full opacity on certain parts if needed. Now the actual decals are just placed planes in Max, and it's usually easiest to just shift drag these faces from the current geometry, change the material ID, and then place them. You'll also want to adjust the UVs, of course, to line up with the decal details that you want. Okay, now that you've seen how most of the materials were created, let's take a look at the mining trench again. Notice now we see all these materials reused on many different building types and shapes. That's the real value and importance of a modular material planning, because it allows you to create a huge variety of assets that otherwise would take much longer if you treated them all as unique pieces. Okay, that wraps up the architecture series, and I hope it's been informative and, and inspiring. Thanks for watching, everybody. Adios!